Hello, beautiful human. Thanks for clicking on our interview with Jesse McCartney. He has a brand new record out now. It's called Better With You, but you know him. Beautiful soul, leaving. How do you sleep? Plus, Jesse McCartney has lent his voice and his talent to a lot of things that you might not know. Like, he's one of the writers on a massive record. He plays one of the most iconic cartoon characters ever. You're going to learn a lot about Jesse McCartney. By the way, he's also hitting the road this summer all across the country. Um, Better With You is the single. This is the interview. Please leave your honest feedback in the comment section below. we got a podcast in there, too. And I beg you, please subscribe. Okay, enjoy. Let's do this. Team. Hey, Heather's here. Dan's Yo, what's here. Up? And Jesse McCartney's in the studio. What's up? Oh, Dude, right. you have not aged a day in 10 years. Thanks, man. <laughs> you look exactly the same. It gets harder. <laughs> <laughs> Is there like a regimen? Is there, do you do things? Do I'm very, like- I'm very, like, I think I'm a lot more aware now um, about just like my physical health and sleep yeah. and just like dieting and eating well. I drink a ton of water. That's kind of like my my routine. You know, when you're in your 20s, like you can kind of get away with a lot more. And then uh, I just turned 31 in, in, in April. And, nice. you know, you just got to, you just can't, you know, it's not as easy as it once was. <laughs> oh, I feel you. <laughs> I feel you, dog. It's harder to recover. It is. Mm-hmm. But, I, you know what, I feel better now than I did in my 20s because I'm more like aware of my body and my yes. health. And physically, like I know what I can get what I have to do to like, you know, maintain to be on top. So what about mentally? What changes in your thirties? I think you just have more experience. You know, I think you just, you've lived a little bit longer. You're a little bit wiser. You've, you've at this point, you're hopefully, hopefully making better decisions. (laughs) And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just like the natural progression of, you know, getting older and, and just experience life experience, life hacks. You've had a lot of experience in life professionally, mostly, but professional and personal, they're kind of linked for, we were just literally saying, I mean, decades. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, I started when I was professionally, I, my first like paycheck, I guess was, I was nine years old. I did a national, uh, Broadway tour of of the King and I with Haley Mills when I was nine. And Ricky Ullman, hello. Ricky Ullman, yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> such a weird fact that you remember. Phil of the um, future. That's true, yeah. He, uh, he. that was the first time, um, first time I had ever done anything, really. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, uh, music or acting. And, uh, and so, you know, I'd done some community stuff with my family growing up. It was kind of a family affair as a kid. And then somebody was like, you should take your kid down to the city and see what he can do, like maybe in, like on the big stage. And it just kind of, all of a sudden, was this thing, and it snowballed into, you know, here we are today. Do you feel like East Coast really helped you out? Because you grew up in New York, Uh and you really were like a bus train ride away from the city. Mm -hmm. So you you had more opportunity closer to you. I think you grow up a lot faster. I mean, you know, you could argue you grow up faster in L.A. as a kid nowadays, but Mm -hmm. I I don't know. In New York, you just, uh, especially in, like, the theater scene and, like, the just that scene is very it's there's a hustle to it and you're constantly surrounded by adults and people that are older than you um you know my whole career i just remember being like the youngest guy on the set you know <laughs> but it's that's true like i would take a train into the city after school i would do a, a, a broadway show and then come back do my homework get up go to school and do the same thing like over every single night but it was also like you know y- your parents could sit there at least for me it's like oh, it's a hobby but it doesn't need to be a hobby you know manhattan's right there like yeah. let's let's put this to the test and like yeah i mean i loved growing something. up in new york you know it was it was nice and i didn't live in the city yeah. i think it's a little harder to, it's a little like rougher to be in the city <laughs> Um, I might, you know, I had a tree and a grass and a baseball <laughs> game on Sundays. You know, I grew up in like suburban New York, but, um, but I, the city was really close too for Manhattan. I love New York. I mean, I still, I think I go there now and I'm like, I, I maybe wish that like I spent more time there as an adult, um, in my twenties. Like yeah. now I'm there and I'm like there for a couple weeks doing press and promotion and stuff for the record. And I'm like, it's like three in the morning and an ambulance is waking me up. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I, I can I can do without living in downtown New York. Like I love visiting, but I I dig LA at this point. I really do. Better with you is the single. It's out now. Yeah, dude, it's a great record. Thanks, man. Solid. Thank you. Top I'm very excited about it. I mean, you uh, a lot goes into this this song. You're doing it all on your own, but you've been doing it on your own for a little bit now. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I. Th- for one, you know, I wrote the song with a couple of people and um, a couple of friends of mine. This guy named Brandon Burnett, who's an incredibly talented singer himself, and his girlfriend Molly Moore. 
Um, and it was during it was written during a time where like everything was just super um, contentious. There was a lot of division in the nation, both politically and socially. It was a lot going on. You'd wake up, you'd turn on the news. It was like a new thing every day. It was just uh, it was just kind of a weird time, and I felt kind of bad. We just wanted to write something that like brought people up and made them feel better. That was just a lighthearted, feel good, just pretty melody. And um, and better with you came out, and it just felt like the right time for that kind of song. And um, so far, it's been. I think the reaction's been incredibly positive. The fans seem to really dig it, and I think it tickles a little bit of like a nostalgic bone for them. It sounds a little reminiscent that. of my older stuff. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really proud of this one. I'm happy with you know how it's been going the way i interpret the record it's like you're in a relationship and you want to be with somebody who makes you a better version of you yeah you know and i think like more you know uh, you know that's another thing like as as you start to experience life and as you get older you realize that um you know it's it's better when you have somebody helping you out and when you have like you know a partner in crime and i think everybody can relate to that you know being in a relationship and finding somebody that brings the best out of you and makes you a better version of yourself and, um, you know, and during those like awful, weird times that are happening in the world, it's nice to to have somebody that um, can give you a break from all that. You know, you've experienced a lot of life, like to say the least. A lot of stuff's been thrown your way. Yeah. Have you had partners in crime that, you know, maybe wasn't your mom or your totally. manager? Well, I'm in a relationship now. I've been with my girlfriend for almost five years or wow. just over five years. And uh yeah, it's a long one. I mean, that's definitely the longest relationship I've ever been in um, outside of, you know, family. You know, <laughs> it's like an intimate relationship. And I've had a couple of others that, you know, for whatever reason, that they just didn't work out. But, um, yeah, I mean, again, like that's, I think, a lot of the basis of some of my songwriting is just the, the ins and outs of being in relationships. How, when you enter a studio today compared to you entering a studio... I mean, we don't need to go back to Dream Street, but like even <laughs> on your solo stuff, like how has your approach to studio work changed? Um, I think I'm just a little bit more maybe responsible with my voice and just my personal health. We were talking about this earlier, yeah. but I think that like just taking care of my body and my voice and, and make sure I'm in tip top physical shape because I noticed like there was a time where I was like kind of like I took a lot of time off for music. I took a few years off and I was just like, I mean, to be totally honest, just like sitting back, getting fat, watching football, like <laughs> nice. eating food and like, you know, cook, cooking a lot, doing stuff that traveling, seeing the world and like doing things that Normal I never really had a chance to do. And but that being said, it was a lot of fun. But like I noticed, like I definitely like my voice kind of suffered from it. <laughs> like I just couldn't like hit some of the notes I was hitting and my runs weren't as tight. So I was like, all right, time to get back in the studio, time to get back in the gym. And so I think for me, like my approach in the studio is just, um, you know, really take care of my voice, especially if I'm going to go do vocals uh, that day. And um, but, you know, for the most part, a lot of it's the same. You know, a lot of times you go in there and you write something and nine times out of ten, it's awful. And that's that one 10 percent of the time that you get a great song that makes it worthwhile. Bleeding Love, you and Ryan Tedder yeah. did that record. Yeah, that was supposed to be yours. Uh huh. Any part of you, I mean, you made a boatload of money off of it, uh -huh. obviously. It's a huge song. But any part of you still wishing that that was a Jesse McCartney original? I mean, you know, there's a part of me that thinks that there's no way it would have been as successful as it was if it was my vocal. Um, and the reason is because she, first of all, Leona Lewis, she, her voice is like very, I mean, it's sort of unparalleled. There's not really any, many females you can name Maybe like Whitney Houston, maybe Mariah Carey, maybe Ariana in today's times. But like, there's just not a lot of female vocalists that can do what she did to that song. And I know, I mean, I couldn't. <laughs> and so um, I think that hit songs are hit songs because of the timing and because of the artist in which it's being, you know, the, the yeah. artist that's releasing it. And, you know, it doesn't mean, a, you know, she could have done Leaving or Beautiful Soul. I mean, she probably could have. But, <laughs> but, you know, I just mean that, like, it's not a hit song isn't a hit song for everybody. And it's funny, like, at first I think I was a little bummed, like, oh, man, this song is taking off. I should have kept it. But then I, like you said, I started seeing, like, paychecks. I was like, okay, this is fine. This is totally fine. <laughs> I'll get over it. Um, but the, the truth behind that is that the label actually didn't love the song. Uh, they told me, they're like, ah, what is this bloody song that you just sent us? <laughs> I'm like... First of all, it's very condescending. Okay. Um, second of all, it's called Bleeding Love. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Like, yeah, I don't think it's really for you. And ultimately, they, they were probably right. And it's probably a blessing that I didn't do it because it ended up in Leona's lap. So, What was that room like, you and Ryan? 
Well, we, we just got in. Again, like, we were writing for my project, and we were, you know, just in the studio uh, writing. And we had written probably three or four other songs first, um, none of which I think got were ever released. Um, and then one day, it was just like a rainy day in Los Angeles, which is very uncommon, as you know. And yeah. um, <laughs> it's just such an L.A. thing to say. But, like, we were just, I just didn't feel like driving to the studio because <laughs> of the rain. <laughs> <laughs> and so I stayed, I was like, yeah, I called Ryan. I was like, yeah, maybe we should just like stay home. And like, now nah. he's like, yeah, come in. He's like, at the worst, we'll like order some Thai food and like watch a movie or just kick it and like not write. And I was like, okay. It was kind of a dreary, bad day. It wasn't really in the moon, mood. And we got in the studio and he pulled up like this B3 organ thing and one of his like many, many MP3s that he had on his laptop. And I was like, that's kind of cool. It's a very simple track if you go back and listen to it. I was like, that's kind of cool. Yeah, maybe I have something. And I went in the studio and started like riffing on the mic. And it just kind of came out. And like we had this one little window in the studio and like the rain was, it was very picturesque. Oh, it's beautiful. So and dramatic. it was just like, yeah, it was raining and it was kind of an odd day. And, and literally we wrote the song in like two and a half hours, three hours. What is your process when you're writing? Do you riff? Do you come in with a story? Like how does it work? Yeah, so I'll come in and like I'll just get behind the microphone and I'll say, okay, play the track, you know? Or like a, for instance, if a producer has like a really, a, you know, a, a collection of tracks, we'll go through them and listen to them pick one and they're usually like in a very elementary state like maybe there's drums and a piano progression or a guitar progression there's nothing to it it's just like skin and bones track and then i'll get in there and you know and i'll just kind of like just hum nonsense and then, and then try words. to find yeah and usually end with vowels because it always sounds nice to end a, a sentence with a vowel and then like get in and try to like paint paint it with lyrics and um a lot of times it works and most times it doesn't but um <laughs> that's usually but usually when, the uh how it works when it works it works it works that song still pays you yeah it does <laughs> Do you th- is that the is that your most profitable song is it my most profitable song it's hard to measure that because you could also argue that like leave and even though i didn't write the song it also allowed me to do like major campaigns yes. and like things with walmart or target or uh you know tours so i mean it's hard to measure it but as far as publishing checks go by far yeah. <laughs> cool. by far it was a good one I'm, I'm very very fortunate for that song it, it, it uh did a lot of things for me that i probably wouldn't have been able to do without it are you always actively writing um, well, yeah, I mean, right now I am. I, you know, during that time, like, where I was just, you know, there was a period after 2014, after I released my In Technicolor record and I toured, I was just exhausted. I had been doing music for, like, 15 straight years without a break, and I just needed to, like, decompress and, like, just kind of walk away and just explore and do other things creatively, and I did a lot of acting projects. I did some some work, uh, guest starring work on, on shows like Fear the Walking Dead yes. and a lot of uh, just like off the beaten path kind of from my regular gig, nine, you know, my regular job. <laughs> and I just, um, I don't know, I, and I wanted to travel so often. As an artist, you travel and see the world, but you never get to see the no, world. you're in and out. You're in and out of a venue or like a hotel room, and it's just kind of a, I don't want to sound like it's a, a boring. It's an, it's an amazing experience, but it is a grind. It's like a lot of work, and you don't really get to, feel the culture of any one place so i just wanted time to like kick it go travel my girlfriend and i went to sweden and like explored nordic cuisine for like two weeks and just ate everywhere and you know hence you know putting on some little extra pounds (laughs) and like i don't know for me uh i took an entire like year and a half or two years off of writing i didn't write a thing deserved did you, ever, did you ever think about like quitting music at all or did that never cross your no, mind? No, I didn't I didn't think about quitting completely. I, I I knew that like I'd eventually get back into it. I just wanted to like try other stuff. I became pretty good in the kitchen. I've become like a master at smoking meat. Nice. I've got like smokers at my house now and like I, I do like awesome parties where people come over and I do like briskets and ribs and Ooh, drunken fancy. chickens and like it's fun. Oh, my house is a lot of fun. <laughs> if you're hungry, you got to come to my spot. No. Yeah. Yes. We'll come over. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Are you the kind of person who like picks up a hobby and you have to be the best at it? Kind of. I yeah. kind of like I kind of I obsess over like a certain thing <laughs> and then I'll put it down. Um, and my girlfriend's similar. Like she's like super into painting and she's like there's canvases all over the house and she's like throwing paint at the wall. <laughs> and uh, and then we'll put it down and then, you know, try something new. But um, I think that's just kind of like the artist in me maybe that's just like I constantly need to be fed new information and try new things and like, oh, let's what's that like? And then and then put it down. 
<laughs> Did you go 15 years of just nonstop work? Would you like in those 15 years, would you have months off or was it just? I mean, yeah, there, you know, there would be time off. It wouldn't be for any ex- extensive period of time or extended period of time. I, I, you know, there was never like, oh, I'm taking a year off um, because, uh, you know, I have a whole team around me, too, that, you know, in many ways, like they depend on each you. other. Yeah. So. There was a time, you know, after that period of time, they're like, hey, are you ever getting in the studio again? (laughs) Or like, what do you think? Like, are we going to tour again? Musicians were hitting me up. Like, when are we going back on the road? So, I mean, there is a little bit of responsibility there, too. But also, um, yeah, I mean, there was there was time off. I mean, we'd always, you know, I remember my very first tour, my Beautiful Soul tour in 2005 was the first time I'd ever hit the road. And I had no idea what to expect, but I was 16 I was just a kid, you know, just this kid out on the road, like traveling. And um, we were doing, it was a grind, like four or five shows a week. They were really trying to like get, get them in, <laughs> make the dough, you get know, you out there. <laughs> and, um, and I just remember like, it was about a total of like 18 months of touring a year and a half. Wow. I was on the road and, you know, there was different legs. Like we do the U S for two months and then I'd take like a week off, you know, and then go to Europe and do like six weeks in Europe. And it was great. And then like, at a certain point, it just hit me, like all just the cumulative travel and uh, being up late and just like I, I became just this zombie. And we ended up having to cancel like two weeks of touring in Japan. And I just like I kind of had a little bit of a breakdown. And um, my mother was out on the road with me. It was like a classic, like I need my mom kind of Aww. moment. <laughs> and uh, and so I just remember that being like I think my mom called the record company. It was like this kid needs some like real time off. Like we're going to like, he needs a couple months to just like totally. And I think that was the last time that I ever had any like real time off. But like she was um, calling you out of school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, it was just like, and it's such an awkward time for any teenager, you know, uh, especially a guy and things were happening, you know, in my personal life. And I was trying to like navigate this weird thing that was happening called fame. And like also trying to finish getting a diploma in high school, uh, it was just a, it was a crazy time, but um, you know, I give you a lot of credit, man, because that does take a toll on your health. Yeah, it, I mean, mentally, physically. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I hard. had a really good team of people around me, uh, and 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 I think that you know, I still attribute like all of the success that I've had to uh, a a, gr- a group of people, family and friends and and colleagues that I've worked with for twenty years that just kind of never gave up, and also just like was able to help me navigate that crazy time that I could have easily gone off the deep end, you know? And I I think so often people have yes people in front of them all the time. And the biggest thing for me, the biggest thing I tell young artists that are coming up right now is make sure you have people around you that are just like, no, you can't do that. People will think you're crazy and won't (laughs) like you if you do that. And I think like that is kind of key in like having any sort of longevity but, but that's also hard to really find right you know is what i was having a conversation the other day with my friend the golden rule the you know the person who owns the gold makes the rules yeah and in a lot of the cases the artist is the money maker it's tricky because they don't want to piss you off right because yeah, yeah. you're paying their you know you're signing their check and they they rely on that and they don't want that to go away so it's a tricky thing to net you know to get around and i don't know i think some of it also is just having somewhat you know some good common sense and just you kind of sometimes you're just either not a good person or you are <laughs> do, you think, and, <laughs> oh, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing social media wasn't big when you like back then i don't know it's hard to say it's hard to, to know the answer to that i think that it definitely um what it's done uh positively for for young artists is obviously the obvious which is it it, it immediately allows you to share stuff with everybody you know uh, at the tip of your fingertips you know back then if i wanted to release a song i'd have to go through 15 different people at a record company there'd be approvals or disapprovals and you know uh, it would be months before you could even push out a song and now i can just literally go on if i want something pull it off my laptop put it on you know spotify or on the internet and it's and it's out there for everyone to see and i think I mean, so many careers that's changed. Bieber uh, was a product of of social media. Uh, There's a lot of artists that had it. I think where there is a disconnect is we've lost a little bit of vulnerability and a little bit of human connection. And I, you know, that's just, that's just kind of the nature of the beast, I think. But do I think it would have changed me at all? I don't know. Maybe I may have been a 
a little bit more of a brat. <laughs> <laughs> I also think you might have had more competition because I think social media and the internet, everybody has a platform, uh-huh. right? Anybody can break through. Yeah. But before, when you were coming up, you had to rely on traditional platforms to get your name out there. Yeah. TV and billboard and radio and all this other stuff, uh-huh. right? Not everybody could do that. Yeah. I mean, you could also argue, though, that that the, the social media platforms... Uh, like help people yeah. to you know i mean without that you know maybe they wouldn't have been discovered you know there's so many artists back then that unless a label came to your show you were never going to get exactly. discovered you know so i don't know you could argue that social media in many ways has actually changed the game and allowed all these talented people to surface you know but then you have cash me outside girl so see that that's the, the downside yeah there's definitely <laughs> like you know she would not have been a thing in, in 2005 you're totally right. No, no, I, I, no. There's definitely, uh, you know, and I don't know the girl, so I can't speak to her. You know, I, I can't speak on behalf of her, her music. But um, <laughs> you laugh when you but say that. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it's it's an interesting thing to see what people are now connecting to. Mm-hmm. And if you if you if you put it down though, like if I'm like, oh yeah, I can't believe that's happening, then I just feel like I'm sounding like an old guy, like looking down on like the young. Yeah. But, That's what I but do, yes, so. there is definitely, there can be a lot of noise that, that squeaks through too, you know? But yeah. that's kind of how it is. Yeah. Yo, I hate to interrupt our interview with Jesse McCartney, but I got to tell you about Quip. It's my favorite toothbrush. You're going to love it. You got to try it. Go to getquip.com slash sang. That is getquip.com slash sang. You're going to get one of the best, if not the best, electric toothbrush on the market. Plus, they start at only $25. I use a toothbrush, my mom, my sister, my roommate, Oprah, uses this cool, fashion-forward, super healthy toothbrush. It's really one of the best. If you go to getquip.com slash sang right now, you're going to get a toothbrush for 25 bucks. plus you're going to get a free refill pack. The way it works is like every month or two, they'll send you new heads, and that's not just for convenience, but it's for your safety, okay? Getquip.com slash sang. Quip toothbrushes. I love them. GQ voted them the coolest toothbrush out there, so... Try them out. I promise. You won't be disappointed. Getquip.com slash sang. What do you think right now of the music industry? <sighs> what music industry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that um, it's, it's a very, it's a turbulent time for, and it has been, you know, and I think everybody is struggling to figure out what's happening, where it's going next. Even four years ago when I released my last record independently, like Spotify was just becoming a thing. It's changed so much and is drastically changing every year that people are just trying to keep up. I think, you know, I'm just really grateful and blessed that I have had such a hard, like a great core audience that have followed me for so long because touring, I mean, as far as artists go, that's really where they make their money. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough out there for artists and songwriters. And I really feel for them, those who who are trying to just make a living writing songs because um, a lot of these streaming services are not fairly compensating artists and writers out there. And I think until we have any sort of litigation or, you know, any sort of legislation, legislation yeah. that catches up and, and finds a way to to compensate fairly for these writers and artists, it, it is going to be a little unfair. And, I, you know, I wish one man could change it, but it's going to take an entire community of writers and, and artists. And I know we've tried, but... It's, I don't know what it's going to take to, to like have a breakthrough, but I really hope it happens soon because there's so many talented people that rely on, on their publishing and, and, uh, and they can't. They have to do something else and they have to, you know, it takes away from their focus, you know, and it's a bummer. But, um, you know, I, I, I got very lucky. I came in early enough where I was able to, to sort of solidify this core, yeah. this core base. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that you say that because the streaming platforms have really – They've put a pressure on these creative minds to con- to create at a pace that they've never created before because the consumption rate of music is so high. Mm. Like the idea that like people need to be releasing new records every couple weeks to remain relevant. I know it was never like that before. I know, I know. And now people are watering down their material so that they can keep up with the demand, and it's unfortunate. Like I'm trying, you know, I, I, it's hard because like I'm trying to understand that. Like, and I do intellectually, I understand that, but I still like, I just like when I'm in the studio and someone's like, yeah, this is good enough. It drives me nuts. Mm-hmm. Like, let's put this out. I'm like, no, dude, it sucks. Like the <laughs> chorus isn't done yet. Like, let's do this. Let's get the guitars right. Like, I don't care if it takes another couple of months. 
And, you know, but at the, at the same time, like, my fans are like, why have you only released one song in the last three months? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, it's, this is the song. Like, we're focusing on this <laughs> song. There'll be a couple more. Like, don't worry. But, like, really, I have right now, like, maybe four or five songs that, like, I'm actually proud of releasing that, and and the others are like okay but i'm not gonna put them out you know unless they're ready unless they're ready and um so that's the thing like i'm releasing probably a collection of four or five records this year um into next year and, and maybe that's it you know but but it's a quality game not a quantity game i think so i think so it's it it's, be. it's it's hard it should be yeah. you, you would hope um and for a lot of artists i think it is there is still a lot of integrity there for many artists but you know there are people who just have a knack for like feeding the the, the hungry machine. People want that content. <laughs> were, you, were you disappointed in the response to In Technicolor? Well, maybe not the response. I think people liked it, but I don't think a lot of people had the chance Heard to listen it. to it. Yeah, they yeah. listened to it. I think, yeah, I think it was one of those records that, again, like it, it sort of fell through a lot of cracks. Um, the music industry was changing as it constantly is, and you know, uh, radio was changing, and and how um, and 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 the influence on radio was changing, and and. Um, yeah, I mean, I was really proud of that. I still am very proud of that album. I think album. that album I was think, so good. I listened thanks. to it again the other day, and I was like, kind of sounds like it's, I don't, Michael Jackson. It thanks, has old Justin dude. Timberlake in it. I really spent so much time and a fortune on that record. I, I really put a lot of time and money and effort into that record and, and had some of the best musicians play on it, some of the best songwriters write on it. And it was, it was, a, it was a really, it was a proud moment for me musically. And, um, you know, it, it's hard to measure success. I think, you know, people that are like, oh, well, you didn't have a number one record or a top 10 or anything. And and that's true. I mean, you know, and but at the same time, like when I listen to the quality of that record, mm -hmm. it really makes me proud. Is that, that success to you now? Totally. Totally. And, and, and it's the same reason why I'm only doing a few songs right now at a time, because those songs to me, like have weight, you know, and, and, and actually mean something. And, I'm trying to hit him with quality. That's my goal. And, you know, I think people are starting to see that. I think the reaction to Better With You has been like, wow, this is something that's like, it has a little bit of, it scratches the surface a little bit more than maybe your typical pop song in today's time. But, um, you know, I, look, it's it's one of those things, you know. And, and uh, you know, I Technicolor, it was, I think after that record, I was just so spent. I was just like, ugh. Did that lead to the break, the four years? Because you put all your time into yeah, this record. Yeah, I think that was like part of it. I think maybe I was, like, at the end of that record, just a little... I was a little disappointed with just, like, its commercial viability and the fact that it wasn't maybe necessarily received like I thought it would be. And I just was like, all right, you know what? This is this is great. I need to take... That's when I was like, I need to take some time off, do some other things, and just kind of clear my head. It's personal, man. I mean, you put so much of your your energy into something... And, you know, you hope people love it. And when they don't love it, like, how you thought they would, it's hard not to think it doesn't... It, I mean, it dings, for sure. It, it puts a ding in your... Do you think people aren't loving or listening to it because they're like, oh, Jesse McCartney, that's the, you know, beautiful soul kid. Like, mm -hmm. what's he... Like, why would I listen I don't to know. I mean, maybe. I mean, I'm sure there's some sort of preconceived notion um, that a lot of people have. But, uh, but I don't know. It's hard for me to really... If I knew that, I would... <laughs> <laughs> I would have every number one album uh, <laughs> ever made. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a good question. I'm, I'm not really sure. I think that, you know, for some people, I was like for a certain, I was for a certain type of person or a certain time in their mm -hmm. life and maybe they had moved on or whatever it was. But um, it's funny because now this record, I, again, like after four years, I had no idea what the engagement was going to be like. I had no idea what to expect from my fans. If they were either going to like tune in for this new project, yeah. if they were going to be like, uh, whatever, dude, like we don't even care. You've been like gone for so hey, long. Who are you? Um, and it was like, I was so overwhelmed with the, with the response. Like this response is much greater than the in technicolor response and i think partly because i was getting back to some earlier roots that's it and maybe like kind of doing something that made them brought them back to a certain time for them and it's definitely paying off i mean the tour we announced the tour um like three or four days ago and already se seven of the cities are sold oh, out dude. um yeah this tour is selling very very well and uh the, the, the audience has proven like that they they still they still are fans. They they want to be there. They want to support, and they they still want more music. I'm sure they want a lot more. Than <laughs> I have, is, is there a nostalgic vibe to the rest of the records? I would say that Better With You is probably the closest thing to, uh, or the most reminiscent of that time. I, there are a couple of other songs that 
are similar maybe lyrically and maybe topically they're similar you know and talk about like current things that are happening but musically i think they're a little bit more modern um and and contemporary you know they have organic elements but with you know some awareness of 2018 production you know are you writing on every record yeah Yeah, i wrote every song well, it, in Better With You, you almost, is that why you put that little dancey part in to kind of keep up with what's I popular think, today? I think that, I think that you know, first of all, if there's anything I've discovered from doing these, col- I've been doing colleges for yeah, the last, I, like, Are like you two sure years. your fans are in college? I think your fans are older than college nowadays. I, I have, ta- I have, so here's the thing, <laughs> you know, here's what I think. I think that the fans that are older, which you're totally right, there's like a prime, like 24 to like 32, there's like a huge chunk of my fans demographically, right? And that was like the beautiful soul crowd and then like 2008 2009 was like five years later from beautiful soul release leaving came out was my first number one record and i think that was like this newer crowd like this younger crowd so i think there's like an 18 to 22 and then there's like a little gap and then there's like 20 (laughs) 25 to like 32 that's at least what i think that's what i'm throwing out there but it's but the colleges like i did 13 colleges this spring semester i was gone every single weekend playing a college around the country it was so much fun um and i forgot what we were talking about but it was uh um yeah i mean the you know the fans they're they're out there and i I think that they they've proven to be you know hungry for more music and i'm I'm gonna try and and do this as long as i can you know that's what i love to do what trend in music have you acknowledged and said you know that's what it was yeah Yeah, i want to incorporate this song yeah so what trend in music i think the drop uh, so that's what it was the fans love i mean people just love a drop in music that's just like (laughs) you know when the when the beat comes back in it's uh, it definitely it's it, people pumped. It moves people for <laughs> sure. I have this song called "Wasted," which is a fun like college record for sure. And the entire chorus is this massive drop, and it's it's totally a guilty pleasure kind of song. There's no doubt that I'm absolutely playing right into the trend of like what people <laughs> love, and 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 that's fine. Like I'm totally willing to to accept that and admit that. Um, and then there's like there's gonna be a lot more heartfelt rec- cuts on the record that are you know, that, that don't pay any mind to that sort of thing. But I think if, you know, if you're not, it, it is pop music and I'm a practical guy. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not reinventing the wheel I'm I'm trying to write great pop music. And if that means, you know, keeping in line with some of, you know, what people want to hear, then I'm, I'm willing to do that to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not out here trying to make like, you know, DJ records or like electronic dance music. You're not going to start rapping? No, I'm not going to start rapping anytime soon. You won't catch me outside, but <laughs> but I definitely, you know, I, I am, you know, I, I am practical, pragmatic guy and I, I understand like, you know, you, you, you want to stay with the time, so. there's a hi- You have a history of re-releasing records. Mm. Right now, we're in a big, let's bring back the old stuff boom. Mm-hmm. Would you ever re-release Beautiful Soul? We're leaving, like give it a modern spin. I don't think so. I mean, I, I kind of feel like I don't want to touch those songs. I feel like they're really sacred to a lot of my fans, and like I feel like doing that. I mean, I'm not. That sounds like I'm really putting myself on a pedestal, and I I, I don't mean it that way. I just mean that like uh, I don't know. I, there's something there's something about those songs that I feel like mark a certain time in my personal life too. Yeah. That to do that might be a little weird. I don't know. Do you think they'd be? Do hits people to- do that? Is that something people no. are doing? Oh, okay. Aaron Carter You're said just- he was re-releasing. Oh, the, uh, yeah. I want candy. I want candy. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. <Cool. laughs> hey, people always d- want candy. That is one thing That's that will true. never change. <laughs> <That's> so. <true. laughs> um, oh. <laughs> we just no, took you, a left turn. You broke him. <laughs> Got him. Do, do you, you still did. enjoy Beautiful Soul? Like I know you perform it, oh. but do you still like it? It's hard not to enjoy that kind of fan reaction. I mean, when you're on stage and you get that kind of reaction, I don't care who, who you are. It's a very human feeling to be like, wow, this is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when they're screaming and singing your song, it doesn't, you know, and yeah, I've, sa- I've sung the song. I can do that song with my eyes closed, uh, you know, sleeping. It's, <laughs> thousands uh, of times, yeah, right? Yeah, it's just thousands of times. And um, it's something that you can't not perform. I can't not perform. It's so closely tied with, I think, for a lot of people, my identity mm-hmm. and you can't you can't also like stick your nose in the air and not play a song that is the reason you got there in the first place. So as much as I love playing the new stuff, I do always play Beautiful Soul. Do I get sick of it? Maybe sometimes, but like 
you know, it's I don't get sick of the reaction that and the, the way people feel when they hear the song. Do you think that song would be a hit today if it was released? I don't know. Um, probably not. Really? Probably not. I mean, again, like uh, it has a sound. It's it's a sound. It's of a time. Yeah. Uh, it there are some like to me like there isn't anything about it actually that does say like oh my gosh that was so da 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 i mean i think like we hear a lot of dance records right now that i think in 10 years people are gonna be like oh my god remember 2018 yeah. um <laughs> but uh, i think there's actually more organic elements to beautiful soul that maybe allows it to kind of cross over into multiple generations but um do i think it would be a hit it's hard to know it's really hard to know what do you think of the boy bands out there now dream street Oh gee, man! I mean, th there's a lot. There's a lot of boy bands out there. There are a lot of boy bands. Hey, you know, as long as there are young prepubescent women, there will always be uh, right thirteen year old. <laughs> yeah, boy room bands. for boy bands. Yeah. Hey, um, you know, look, look, that was a part of my uh, early career and something that you know I I own. I mean, it was uh, it was a way for me to get my foot in the door, and everyone's got to do it somehow. And I loved D Dream Street. I yeah. grew up on your stuff, uh, all of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a, it was a time for sure. I think we were like riding on the coattails of Insync and Backstreet Boys, and we knew it. We were like, "Oh, this is gonna end soon." But <laughs> hey, in the meantime, we yeah, you know, right. like, let's go. Um, but I wonder if there's other members of these boy groups out there knowing that it's gonna end soon because you can't have not every boy group can rise to the top. You know, I think they must know. I mean, unless you're just completely dense. I mean, like you have to know that. It doesn't last for forever. I mean, you look at, especially, you know, when you're that age and you're in a boy band, you've probably, the boy bands that have come before you, you were probably a fan of at some point or you looked up to, so, and you knew that that ended. So, I don't know, maybe, you know, who knows? Who knows what they think? Were you always planning during that stage of life for your solo stuff? Knowing no, that? I don't think I was ever planning for any pop music career. I really wanted to do, like theater and acting and uh, stage work. Like, I never really thought that music and becoming, like, a pop singer would be at all part of my plan. Like, at all. You I think that Dream Street was just, like, another fun thing I could do after school and had no intention of, like, having fans or getting famous. It was just like, oh, I get to sing music, and it was purely just a joyful thing for me. And it had no intention of, like, you know, making a career out of, like, singing pop songs. It was just another part of like entertainment that I thought was cool to try. Have you thought about going to Broadway? I've thought about going back to Broadway and I've had like, I've had some discussions with certain people in the Broadway community about like what that would be. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, there's something I think as you get older too, that, you know, early on, like theater is awesome. It's a grind. It's a really hard Dude, thing to eight do. Eight shows a week? Eight shows a week. And, you know, for, after a certain amount of time it's it's like you're doing the same thing oh it's it can be very monotonous you know it's like the same thing over and over and over and i, I at, at a certain point after a few years of doing theater i was like i gotta do something else but you could do a cool limited run somewhere and totally and i and now that i'm older i'm like there's that like itch now to get back to my roots and maybe try that my hand at it again and cool. um you know I, w I like i was theatrically trained that's what i started doing so I, i'd love to do it and i think there is more than ever like such a respect now in the theater that me, th there always was but it, it is now like bled into every other aspect of of the entertainment from television to film you see so many stage actors taking left turns and doing tv and vice versa so they're kind of interchangeable now and i feel like a lot of guys that get roles in this town that i know that i'm friends with were like theater guys you know there's like there's like a respect thing Dude, I because think, you're the, it, you you hit it, you yeah. hit the nail on the head. It's the way you're trained. It's the totally. work ethic. It's the yeah. grind. It's yeah. a, like people look at stage actors sometimes or Broadway show, and they kind of discredit them almost. But in reality, I mean, they're they're hard. They work harder than a lot of other actors. It's one of the hardest mediums, in my opinion, because you're you're completely vulnerable. You can't hide behind anything. There's no editing. Mm -hmm. It's you and an audience and the stage and nothing in between. It's a very like. It's a, it's an intense thing, and um, very few people can do it. Is there a dream musical you'd want to be in? I, I mean, I grew up loving Rent. I thought that was like one of like my fa as a kid. Like when mm -hmm. I I saw that show a million times on Broadway, and just loved the the score and the music to it. And uh, it went off Broadway before I was ever like old enough to be a part of that cast because everyone was in their twenties and thirties. Did you see like, the original like with Anthony Rapp yep, and Adina Menzel? Yep, I saw the the original <sighs> cast. Jealous. I know it was it was like such a cool time for theater. Um, I love Rent. Uh, 
I love these, like, honestly, like, uh, I love these, um, what did I just see the other, what did I just see on Broadway? I saw it, like, three weeks ago. Mm, must have been good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's about the kid. Uh, Dear on. Evan Hansen? Dear Evan Hansen, thank you. Phenomenal. Phenomenal show. Oh. Very powerful. I, like, cried through the entire thing. I was just, like, a wreck. My girlfriend's like, pull it together. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Like I'm the staff in the relationship, but um, but how hard is it for those actors who, who evoke that emotion from people sometimes twice a day? I don't know. I I didn't get to see um what's his name either. Uh, I didn't get ben to see, Splat. Yeah, Ben Ben Platt. Platt 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 Platt, 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 Platt. You know, close enough. I I uh, didn't get to see him, but I heard that like that just like the way that he performed, he was like crying through the singing. Like I don't even know how you do that, um, but it was like just such a powerful show, and the music was amazing and such difficult songs to sing like yeah. ah, amazing dude we mentioned aaron carter do you mind being categorized in that whole pop 2k you know aaron carter jesse mccarty i think it's Ryan like Cabrera? a natural i think again like it's like one of those things that people do it's like association with the time so i mean but don't you want to be like hey i'm still here i'm not i'm still around <laughs> yeah i mean you know i i think that uh you know that there are certain people who follow my career and then certain people that like loosely followed it. And for those who loosely followed it are like, Oh yeah, the guy from like beautiful soul days. Like, <laughs> but you know, that's, I think that's with a lot of people, you know, mm -hmm. I dig seeing you in the voiceover studio. Thanks. Yeah. Doing a lot of voiceovers. Voiceovers are like, I think a part of my career, like nobody knows about. <laughs> and it's, it's, um, it's one of the greatest gigs, uh, because a you're not on camera you can literally show up I like get out of bed I grab make my coffee put on my house shoes and like go in my pajamas to the studio record for like two three hours in the morning and I'm done by 10 a.m. Do you record in your own studio? Or do you go to no I go to different studios Got but, it. Um, like How Alvin and the Chipmunks was like another like that was like a franchise that like changed my life in many ways and like a lot of people don't know that it's like something that I've done <laughs> you play Theodore. Theodore. Yeah, Theodore. Yeah, Theodore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Theodore. Um, the green one <laughs> and I and I just did uh, I just did the new season of, of Young Justice and oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, it's it's a great gig. I love I love doing voiceovers. I've done them for a long time. You make a killing, don't you? It's a good it's a yeah. good it's a good way to make dough. <laughs> oh, Let me tell you, like there are so <laughs> many guys in that room that I work with, like that are on microphones that like around me, there's like the Scooby Doo guy and like the tur the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle guy. These guys yeah. show up, okay? Mm -hmm. These guys, you would never in a million years peg these guys for being like superstars. These guys are rolling up in like Phantoms and Lambos mm -hmm. and right, and they're just like you know middle aged guys with guts, like just <laughs> hanging out like in the studio. And because once you get that gig, you don't yeah, let it go. They you just know what have I mean? it made, yeah. and they get the call like all the time. Hey, we're doing the the new Scooby Doo. Can you come in? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there on Monday. Like. Just it's a total, it's a business in itself that like a lot of people don't realize is like, it's cool. Dude, super lucrative. You can yeah, do so many one. different parts. Mm -hmm. You know Beautiful. what? I, I supplement a lot of like my music and being in the music industry and trying to make music uh, with, with stuff like that, that I know that um, is always going to, you know, th those are like, you know, my, my bread and butter. And if I need to spend a little extra on my music to do this and this, I can because of stuff like that. And uh, it's just kind of like a a cycle you know why do you think you're perfect for voiceover like when when you audition for the first time what did they <laughs> say like your voice is great because of i don't know why i actually personally hate my speak like when i listen back to my speaking voice it doesn't i mean i think for a lot of people it doesn't sound like what you hear in your head yeah. and uh it's not to me it's not like i don't know what they what they like about it but somebody likes it and i'm happy to do the work so <laughs> so Man, what do you think of the Leonardo DiCaprio comparisons? I've been getting it a lot as I as I get older, and I mean, there are worse people to look like as a star, right? oh, yeah. Yeah. as a movie star. Um, I love I love Leo. Leo is like one of the reasons I wanted to act when I start first saw the um, the Basketball Diaries. Um, to me, like that was like one of the coolest like dramatic roles. And what's eating Gilbert Grape was like I thought he was just unbelievable in that movie and. I, I, you know, who doesn't like a good old school Leonardo DiCaprio film? When so. you look in the mirror, do you see it? I mean, I can, I can see why people draw the comparison. We have like similar eyebrows and foreheads and, you know, similar eye shape, I think. But hey, they can cast me as his yeah. brother in something. <laughs> 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 play. Jesse McCartney. Hey. Dude. Appreciate you. Well, it's actually, good to see you guys. I have one more question about the music video. Go ahead. Who thought of the idea to almost make it like two videos in one? Love it. Where it's like, 
you find was it the quarter they the, the quarter you picked up? Yeah. Who thought of that whole idea? So I I, I I did really with um with my director. So this director, her name is Joe Roy, and she's a Canadian director. And I had seen like a ton of reels from different directors, like people have been submitting ideas and treatments for the song. And they were all pretty bad, and I didn't like really any of them. And then I came across <laughs> Joe's tape. I mean, Frank, just to be honest, and I came across Joe's to- uh, tape, uh, and I didn't wasn't initially like taken with her treatment that she her, like her idea for the video. And it's hard to do that because unless you know that artist personally, like y- y- it's, mm-hmm. you're just like throwing paint at a wall. You yeah. don't know what they're gonna react to. But I loved her reel. I loved what she had done, and I, I thought she was a beautiful cinematographer. And so I. I said, I, I don't know what it is. This isn't the treatment, but I love her. Like, I want to work with her. So I called her, got her on the phone, and for weeks we were just, like, spitballing, like, throwing around ideas until we got to, you know, the heart of the song, which is about this, like, long-term relationship that paints, uh, you know, a picture of what it's like to be in a real relationship that's not just, like, all the, like, cute stuff it's like the real stuff you like know? the fight like, scene the, the, like the fight stuff and like just having you know just showing a real relationship that people can relate to and it was tough we did it over two days and it's incredibly hard to like bring in an actor you've never worked with Danielle Campbell who was amazing uh, and just like all of a sudden jump into this like super intimate thing um, but she was a total pro and you know we wanted to do this butterfly effect where the court getting back to the quarter so that the, the quarter rolls by my shoe these were actually the shoes I was wearing uh, <laughs> rolls by my shoe and um, you know the whole idea is that something as incidental as like a quarter hitting your shoe can change the course of your relationships mm-hmm. to come and um, you know I, I think it really like it nailed it like I think it was done Joe did a great job at shooting it, and it wasn't like it's so easy when you have like a relationship video for it to be like super cheesy yeah. and cornball. And I think it was just enough, like it was a balance. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was really happy with that video. It, it took a while to like figure it out. We were trying so many different ideas, like, oh, like let's try this graffiti idea. Like backwards graffiti was one thing we were talking about doing at one point, where it's like, have you heard of this like new thing? No. It's like where people have. Uh, like I guess like a dirty wall and they're cleaning it like with like air brushes oh. and stuff. It's like a huge like art form right now, underground like art form. It's so cool, you guys. <laughs> so trendy. Uh, so trendy right now. And um, <laughs> but like and then so it's like reverse graffiti and it had nothing to do with the song. It just looked it looked cool, but I was like, eh, whoa. Why? so we we're like let's just do this love thing, but like let's make it authentic and make it look like a real relationship. So, are the records connected? Um, they're, uh, I would say that they sonically are very, very, you know, they're very similar. I mean, they're different subject matter on every song. I wouldn't say that they're threaded in the sense that, like, Better With You then goes into an interlude into the next song, um, which is something I did with In Technicolor. But in this case, um, just all of the musicians are are the same players, um, and the production is the same producer, um... Um, same couple producers, and um, yeah, I think just sonically, it's it's cohesive. How do you pick producers now? Like anything else, you listen to their work. You know, you kind of listen to what they're working on or what they've done. And um, you know, f- for this, I worked with uh, Eric Hudson, who's a guy that I worked with in the past on my my departure album, and uh, he's done a lot of stuff for Kanye, and he's like a piano genius, like a just a, a, an amazing pianist, and. Um, I knew I wanted like piano and guitars on the record, and I brought in my my guitar player who I've been touring with for years, Dory LaBelle, who uh, is the guitar player on The Voice, actually. Cool. Um, plays with the house band on The Voice, and he's an insane musician. And so a lot of the same guys I've played with for a long time, and I think that just makes for like a nice well, You know each package. other. Yeah, we know each other. I, they know what I want. I know what, they, you know, I know what they're capable of, and... So it's good when you ha- build up a rapport with guys like that over the years. You can kind of get in each other's head and know exactly, like, oh, Jesse's not going to like that or he's going to like, you know. So, Do we have a date for the rest of the records? Nope. <laughs> cool. Do you have a date? <laughs> nope. Cool. <laughs> That's how we but, end. <laughs> but I am going on tour. I'm touring, uh, you know, the middle of June, um, starting June 15th and going to the end of July uh, around, it's a U.S. tour. Cool. Um, and eventually I'll probably be going overseas as well. But um, So you're but not going to tour these records? No, I am. Ones. I am. So so just to, so the next song will be coming out at some point at the end of the summer, early fall, and then followed by an EP. And Beautiful. I just don't have a date for it yet because I don't know exactly what that looks like yet. And when I want it to come out, it's, 
you know, like we talked about earlier, the music industry is changing so much. I have to sort of, it's a delicate balance and there's no rules anymore. And I just kind of have to figure out, I don't want to like set myself up for a date and then have to like move around that. So I'd rather just be like coming out next week. Boom. <laughs> Here we go. Just drop it. Yeah. But if we see you on tour, you will play the records. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. I'm playing new songs on tour. Beautiful. Yeah. You mentioned the meat thing. Would you be able to be a vegan or what do you think of vegans? <laughs> I what's love your, that. What's your take on vegans? Oh, just to wrap this up, what do you think of vegans? Um, to each their own. I'm a meat guy myself. I like to smoke a great brisket, and people come over for my pork butt. But you know, I can smoke a veggie patty if you need me to. Um, you know, I like that. How does I like that, that work? <laughs> Just uh, same. I'll the be same there. Thing. I'll Jesse be McCartney, over. known for his meat and for his music. That's it. Yeah. Meat and music, baby. That should be the title of the EP. <laughs> meat and music. That's yeah. good. Real yeah. good. Jesse McCartney. Thank everybody. you, guys. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you did, please subscribe. And also check out our podcast. There's a link in the description. And also comment and like and do things. Other interviews are on the screen somewhere. So click them. Thanks for watching.